You are listening to the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. Now, in today's episode, we talk about a health issue that affects millions of men across America. Uh, we talk about erections, uh, and we talk about the five ways to improve your erection, uh, basically keeping you hard, not just physically, but in the other way. Um, now, this episode is brought to you by one of our sponsors, Legion. Now, Legion makes some of the best performance-enhancing supplements around. In fact, Amazon named them one of the number one sports performance-enhancing supplement companies around. They make great products for people who want to build muscle, burn body fat, or improve their performance. Uh, one of my favorite products of theirs, besides their protein powders, is their pre-workout. It's actually a clean pre-workout, not overstimulated, and it's got uh, efficacious amounts of ingredients that are backed by studies and science. But there's lots of other products, and because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a discount. Just go to buylegion.com. That's B U Y L E G I O N dot com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump for 20% off. Also, this month, we're running a new interesting promotion. We've taken three bundles designed for three different types of people and discounted them tremendously. So here's what we did we took MAPS programs, workout programs, and we've put them together for beginners. We've put together a bundle for people who are intermediate, and we've put together a bundle for people who are advanced. All three bundles give you roughly nine months of exercise programming. In other words, you sign up, and your workouts are planned out for you for a full nine months. Again, there's a beginner, intermediate, and advanced bundle. Go learn more about them at mapsdecember.com. Again, that's maps, M-A-P-S, december.com. Hey, you guys know how last week, I think it was, I brought up that uh, survey from the UK about like men and erectile dysfunction? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so there was that big survey, and according to the survey, something like almost 50% of the men. Is that what it was? Yeah, it was wow. like 40-something percent of the men in the survey said they had suffered from erectile dysfunction. What was the age group again? Was yeah, I was going to say, this is a younger they population, were younger. right? Yeah, they were younger, so it was, uh, was kind of interesting. And so I, I pulled up some statistics on it because um, from what I've read, it seems to be climbing. Um, it says, uh, I just looked it up, and it says that it affects about 30 million men in the United States. One out of 10 men is estimated to have erectile dysfunction. The U.S. has the highest rate of self-reported erectile dysfunction. Um, it affects about 10% of men per decade of life. In other words, 50% of men in their 50s, 40% of more in the 40s, 30% in the 30s, and so on. Yeah. So men in older than 40 are three times as likely to experience uh, erectile dysfunction um, than younger men. So it's a thing. Yeah. It's one of those clear examples of uh, poor health. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's funny because we've talked about this on the, on the podcast before, how men's testosterone levels have been declining now um, for decades. I think since the 70s, since they've been kind of testing it. I wonder if they go kind of hand in hand because now we're saying you know starting to see this. this I, issue. I was surprised how how many DMs that I got when we started talking about when I came off of testosterone and we were having that conversation quite a bit right around mm -hmm. that time like was it three years ago or so when has it been that long Yeah oh wow yeah it's been three years now over three years uh, when I talked about coming off testosterone and just the the depression I felt and then the the lack of any sort of energy or wanting to go lift and. Um, I got a lot of DMs and a lot, what surprised me the most about the DMs were they weren't other, you know, 40 year old plus men that were DMing me and saying that they struggled with the same thing. It was young men. Yeah. It was a lot of young, mm. young guys in their early twenties, some even teens, uh, but like probably averaging between like 18 and like 25 was like the, the yeah, the it, it makes you think how much of the environment has changed or anything that, that has affected this to, to be where we're at right now with, you know, younger generation coming up and this being a problem already. Yeah. Well, for a long time, we've connected, uh, erectile dysfunction with, uh, with poor health because it's a, it's a vascular, it's a vascular system, right? Mm -hmm. When you get an erection, you, you, your, the blood vessels, dilate, blood has to flow in there. And, and if you have erectile dysfunction, one of the first things the doctor will do is look at blood pressure and blood lipid levels because it's one of those things that can be an indicator um, of poor health. But aside from that, um, you know, f you know, for men, I could, uh, it's hard to think of, of something that would make you feel, that would be more challenging to deal with, right? Because it's kind of like a part of right. your identity as a man, it's especially if you're very egocentric. Yeah, especially if you're with your partner yeah. and you're you love them, you're attracted to them, and then this happened, and you're just like, uh, you know, you got to try and explain yourself or oh, whatever. It, it was it, 
the the depression that I went through afterwards was probably one of the more challenging things that I'd ever been through for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not like one of those. It's not like a single day thing either. It's not like one day you feel bad and then it's a bad day and you're depressed and then the next day you kind of snap out of it. It's like this ongoing battle that you feel and of these ups and downs and. You know, and then you you're you know the things that you're supposed to do, and when you are trying to do that, and you have no motivation, no drive to that, it just makes it that much harder. So it's yeah. kind of like this spiral spiraling effect down when you when you get hit with something like this, and then and then I also think too, there's a lot of things today that uh, we are dealing with that we weren't really dealing with like just you know two decades ago, and we I think we alluded in that podcast when we brought this up. Uh, one of those being like porn and stuff like that. It wasn't as readily available mm -hmm. as it is today as it was for us when we were kids and even just tech and being on our phones mm -hmm. and being distracted mm -hmm. all day it long. It has to be a factor, you know, in terms of being desensitized somewhat to the experience of it in sure. general and the connection of it. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't realize, uh, or actually, okay, when I first got into fitness, right, I had a big passion for it. And as I started training clients, especially as I started training older clients, and when I say older, Remember, I started at the age of 18. So when I, for me, older was anybody. Everybody. Yeah, <laughs> everybody yeah, everybody else. Older. Anybody <laughs> over the age of 35, right? But I used to start, I would get these comments from my clients about their libido. And I, you know, at the age of 18, I didn't realize that exercise had an effect on libido or whatever. I never even thought of it. But these clients would come to me and they'd say, you know, my male clients would tell me like, oh man, I, I, my libido is like it was when I was younger. And my older, my, then my older, older clients, right? People in their like 16 above, they would kind of bring it up a little bit. Like they'd come up to me and say things like, hey, I'm noticing uh, some changes. And I'd say, oh, you're getting leaner? Uh, no, not really quite. I have more energy. And I'd be like, oh, you're waking up early? <laughs> not that kind of energy. And then I'd get it, you know, like, oh, yeah. it's affecting well, that right there. Energy, energy. Yeah. So, um, you know, exercise has a profound uh, impact um, on those things. So, you know, I, I know we're not uh, necessarily medical experts on <laughs> erectile dysfunction, yeah, no. but, uh, but we do talk a lot about health and there's a very strong connection with health and your ability to achieve uh, erection. Um, one of the first things you can do, and you can, you can actually look this up, and what they'll say in medical literature is to exercise. In my experience with clients that I've worked with, lifting weights produces the most profound effect when it comes to libido and with men when it comes to erectile dysfunction. I remember, Adam, when you were going, when you had come off testosterone, you said when you'd lift weights, you could tell. Oh, I, you know, and I don't know if when we put this together, right, if you guys were thinking like the order that we listed them in as far as the priority. I think we were just kind of spouting off all the things that we think are important when we were taking notes. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, that was the, the single biggest difference maker. So yeah, like the other ones that we'll cover, I think uh, I felt a difference or make a difference, um, but nothing felt uh, like it impacted that more than just lifting heavy. And the thing that I think is important, or at least was I felt was important for me, was that uh, it I had to be careful on how much I did. So you know, the first thing is like, oh, lifting weights makes your libido go up, and and you and helps you with erections, and then all of a sudden you go. Oh, well, then more of it must be better. Mm. And I found that it, there was like a very specific dose to me that made that impact. And any more than that didn't necessarily make a difference. And so, and that was literally just two to three times a week, a full body type of strength routine. Mm -hmm. um, I would always feel the next 24 hours after that, I noticed a difference. And then if I would try to push it to four or five days, I felt like I was more sluggish and it didn't actually ha help the same way. Right. Well, resistance training is the one form of exercise that has been clearly shown to raise testosterone. Mm -hmm. Now, all forms of exercise, if they improve your health and you have low testosterone, will improve your testosterone. But only resistance training raises testosterone in all men. Mm -hmm. So if your testosterone levels are normal and you lift weights, they go higher. If they're high and you lift weights, they go even higher. And definitely if they're low... They go up, and that's part of the the adaptation process that resistance training uh, asks your body to do. It's telling your body to add new tissue, new active tissue, which requires more of the anabolic hormone testosterone. So you, it's literally directly telling your body raise testosterone. Well, that's why I like to suggest lifting weights and not just this general exercise, because a lot of people would throw running in there and. I would argue that somebody in this in this context who is already low te potentially low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, maybe battling depression, whatever, mm -hmm. 
and then you go tell the, and then they go oh, I'm going to go for a run and they go for these long long runs I don't think that that would I mean in the in the context of losing body fat right. and if that brought their body fat percentage down below 15% it could help, it could help. Yeah. I could see that maybe if they use it as like a de-stress like mentally like it's something they did that was like therapeutic in that way but yeah like what's missing is the drive and and you know and, and testosterone and, and focusing on being able to elevate your testosterone by lifting heavy weights is definitely yeah. a benefit in this well, I, I guess it would also benefit circulation too right so you're you're getting out and running and moving, it's going to improve that. And since that has to do with, uh, you know, being able to get an erection, I think that would also benefit. But I could also see where really easily you could overdo that and then the, the opposite would happen. Well, there's a connection with um, uh, endurance exercise and low testosterone. So over endurance exercise applied often can lower testosterone levels. Strength training done properly does the opposite. And I, like I said, it reliably raises testosterone. But you can overdo it too. Like Adam said, you yeah. need to do the right amount. And in my experience, if you're getting stronger, that's the one of the best signs that'll tell you that you're moving in the right direction. Now, you, you did talk about blood flow. Okay, yeah. You did talk about improving cardiovascular or, or, or vascular, I should say, health. Uh, in the past, we thought it was cardio that did that better than anything else. Studies now show that resistance training does it just as well. Oh, if, is that true? That's right. I didn't know that. Just as well, if not better. Mm. Um, now, here's the other part of it, and I'm going to go a little little sidetrack here. The pelvic floor muscles in men are also very important to uh, achieving an erection. Some of the best pelvic floor exercises a man can do are resistance training exercises, squats and lunges and hip thrusts and deadlifts. Strengthen the muscles that support the pelvic floor. Weak pelvic floor muscles in men uh, also cause problems just like they do. Uh, is that is that uh, connected to ED? It is. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. It is also connected. Oh, that's to interesting. And so, resistance training the best form of exercise uh, for this particular reason. Then there's a psychological piece. Okay, let's let's all be uh, you know clear here. Obviously, uh, an erection is a very masculine thing. Improving your masculine feeling or your masculinity or at least the way you look to be more masculine might psychologically also help you. Building muscle just does that, right? If a man builds muscle, he automatically starts to feel more confident, mm -hmm. a little bit more masculine. That psychological piece can also help quite a bit with the erection uh, situation. So definitely lift weights. And for most guys, for health purposes, two to three days a week of a full body workout is probably all you need. Straight sets, focus on the big compound lifts. I, I also would give recommendation of two of just uh, of trying to avoid having a sedentary lifestyle. So even if you go to the gym three days a week and you just lift, but then the rest of your day you sit on a chair yeah, or you point. sit at a computer and stare at the screen, uh, I think there's just a lot of benefits of just getting in the habit of moving and mm -hmm. talk about improving circulation. Just just you getting up and taking walks and getting outside. I think the outside benefits of the sun and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm my my prescription for myself or what I would it'll help clients with this in this situation is this two to three day a week strength based program and then also trying to include more walking outside on a regular basis. I think can make a big difference. Yeah, too. everything in an active body pretty much uh, functions a lot better. Yeah, I would. I for me, my approach with the walking is just the one that I found to work best that I can stick to, mm -hmm. is a ten to fifteen minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Turns into thirty to forty minutes of walking uh, throughout the throughout the day, and because it's attached to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm just more consistent. It's easier than scheduling a forty five minute walk. Now, you know speaking of that, that's the other thing that I think is important is also diet. Um, and you know, and by diet, I think. Following a diet can be really dangerous in this situation, right? Like, uh, there's so many popular diets right now where we're eliminating a macronutrient. And the general recommendation that I'm giving to someone like this now, mind you, if you have special conditions uh, where you need to, that's one thing. But for the general population that is following some generic diet where you eliminate a, a macro in there because you're trying to you know lose body fat, this person, I actually care about them having a more balanced diet than anything else. Yes. Uh, nutrient deficiencies are one of the first places that uh, a doctor will look if you suffer from uh, erectile dysfunction from a nutritional standpoint. Zinc and vitamin D in particular, um, if those are low then you can start to notice issues with testosterone and with, uh, with, with vascular health. 
So zinc, uh, you can find, and there's that whole, what's that myth? Uh, like, like uh, was it uh, clams or uh, that are oysters? Oysters, oysters yeah. are, are uh, like a it's aphrodisiac. Supposed you, yeah, it's supposed to make you horny, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's because they have, they're high in zinc. That's where they come from. So uh, shellfish are high in zinc. Meat is high in zinc. Um, uh, what's the whole pineapple thing? Uh, that's. I'm, just, that's, I'm not going to go. There. That's, uh, <laughs> that'll be another something, podcast. Something totally different. <laughs> yeah. um, eggs are high in choline. Choline is also beneficial, and some scientists would say, or, or some nutritionists would say, choline should be considered a uh, you know uh, an essential nutrient um, because lacking choline can cause some serious problems. Eggs, full, whole eggs, are a wonderful health food. Now, when we were doing when we were doing this, like because uh, my my protocol was was less about erectile dysfunction and just generally getting my testosterone mm-hmm. levels. Uh, uh, we were, I was following a balanced diet and then you were also having me supplement a few things. Talk a little bit about those and does this apply to this person also? Yeah. So supplement for your deficiencies. So if you get tested and you find D or zinc, for example, is low supplement with those. And then there's some herbs that you can take that seem to help. Uh, ashwagandha is uh, pretty healthy. Yeah. Um, and has been shown to help uh, men with low testosterone and with uh, erectile dysfunction. Yeah, I've also heard you talk a lot about uh, cholesterol, even mm-hmm. if there's a deficiency uh, there and, and maybe like introducing that. That's an old, so now here's the thing with dietary cholesterol. That's an old bodybuilding thing that I have noticed personally and I've yeah. also had clients. Just friends. anecdotally. Yeah, just like increasing yeah. my dietary cholesterol. I'm not cholesterol. making claims, but I, I know I noticed that too. Yeah, so. well, cholesterol is a, is a, it's a base steroid hormone. Uh, chemical, right? So your, your body takes that and turns it into all kinds of different things, including t- t- testosterone. Mm-hmm. So old school bodybuilders would increase their cholesterol intake. Um, and uh, by the way, very few, some people will have their lipids will go all over the place if, for, if you do this. Most people won't. Most people, this is totally fine. Um, you'll notice almost like this boost of, of testosterone from doing it. Now, what's your thoughts on like processed foods? Is this something that you would right away cycle somebody off of? Totally, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. you're going to overeat, right? Processed food encourages overeating. They're not uh, typically as healthy. Um, here's another one too. Avoid alcohol. You know, in that same survey that I talked about with uh, the with the English, it was in the UK where they it was like almost half of the men had erectile dysfunction. One of the number one reasons they said was uh, alcohol consumption. Yeah. Um, so what about uh, marijuana right now? See, that see that's that one's funny. The animal studies reliably show mm. testosterone or anabolic hormones lowering, uh, getting lowered from chronic uh, marijuana. The human studies are mixed. Some say mm. it might, some say it doesn't, but in animal studies, it's pretty reliable. I've had clients go off or reduce marijuana and notice improvements personally. Um, and then I know people who use marijuana and it helps with their erections. Yeah. So really? I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I guess it. I guess maybe the hmm. uh, the psychological part. Right? I think it's that, right. Yeah. If you are somebody if who's you're feeling good, right, in your head or something like that, and then that kind of lightens, loosens the mood or lightens you up a little bit, and then you can get into the mood. I could see how that put, potentially could help. But I, for me, uh, if I smoked too much, it was it, it actually I felt like it lowered. Yeah, I feel my, like it has a little bit of an estrogenic effect on some level. Well, I mean, I I told you that when we were first going through all that, when I came off the uh, gynecomastia, would uh, my gyno would flare up from that. I noticed that from any time I was, if I was excessively smoking, that it would flare up really bad. I take a couple of days off, it would go completely away. Well, I know mm-hmm. if a, if a young man goes to the doctor with uh, test estrogen issues, that sometimes they. Uh, well, often the last, do you smoke marijuana? Let's get you off that and see what happens. And mm-hmm. how much does that make a difference too? Is just how the our our estrogen levels to our testosterone with ED. So if we if I get like if I happen to have like really high estrogen levels as a male, will that affect uh, my uh, erections? Oh, totally. I, so this is from bodybuilders, right? Bodybuilders use anabolic steroids, and their estrogen levels are always all over the place, right? Because their 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 testosterone will be so high from the steroids that they take that a big chunk of it gets converted to estrogen. And if their estrogen is too high, they notice that they're not able to get erections or the libido's down. On the opposite end of the scale, same thing. If they hammer estrogen with anti-estrogen drugs, they'll also notice libido, yeah, yeah, yeah. libido issues. So. You know, that reminds me too, talking about that, uh, what I always noticed when I started to get close to a show was um, you know, running too low a calorie for too long. So yes. here's the thing you got to be careful, and I've seen this happen with clients where a doctor is telling them, oh, you know, Exercise, diet, and exercise lose weight. They're they're giving that as a recommendation. So this kid so goes. Now they up, obsessively do it, right? So then this kid starts exercising, reduces his calories dramatically, mm-hmm. and sure, maybe the scale is going down a little bit, but it's not helping his ED anymore because of how low calorie he is too. Yeah, in mm. fact, being too lean or too fat uh, will have you'll have issues with this. Too fat, I think that one's kind of widely understood. That if you're overweight, you got poor vascular health. Uh, your blood lipids are off. 
um, that that has been shown in the scientific literature to, to negatively affect the quality uh, and amount of erections that a guy will get. Uh, what's not as co- what's not as common, at least uh, or in the mainstream, is the is understanding how getting too lean will cause that. But you talk to anybody who gets super shredded for a bodybuilding competition or physique or anybody who gets super lean for a photo shoot, any guy, and ask them about their libido and they'll tell you it's in the tank. Yeah, Getting too lean mm-hmm. can cause problems as well. And I know in my experience, um, once I got below 9% body fat, I started to per- personally start to notice some effects. Some guys might need to get a little leaner. Other guys, you know, you know not, not so lean and they'll still notice and what, it. And what's the prevailing theory on that? Uh, well, getting too lean, okay, anything that tells- Because you would think, okay, someone who's shredded, all right, because it seems a little counter, right? right? Like, why would this dude who is lifting weights like crazy, even on testosterone, all of a sudden they're, they're, they have problems getting an erection? Well, think about it this way, right? If your body- it feels like it's not a good idea to procreate, uh, then it's going to lower your ability to have. So it's uh, a similar sex. thing as for females, right? How Except they lose, women they are lo- way more they sensitive. Lose their, they lose their period if they get too lean. Yeah, and they get they're they're way more sensitive. Like because a guy can get really lean compared to a woman and not have negative issues. Women have mm-hmm. to maintain much higher body fat than men do, um, but still getting too lean. And it's also the process of getting really lean, right? When you're when you're the process of getting really really lean usually involves a lot of exercise. And a low calorie diet, and over yeah. time, that stresses the body. It's physically exhausting. Now, exactly. I, I know there is a uh, there's a wide range because of the individual variants. But what's the literature say about like the a? I mean, the percentage range. Like, where should you be? What like for for a man? Well, I know from what I've read, uh, below I want to say below eight percent is where they start to say, eh, you probably don't want to do that. And I think essential body fat for men is. I want to, if I'm not mistaken, four or four percent. Mm. Essential meaning like below four percent, you're starting to get just straight up dangerous. Yeah, um, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't quite know. Yeah, what and I know there's a, a variance too, right? Yeah. So it might be eight, but then some guys will report at six they feel amazing. So there's always going to be a little bit of. of a, a gray I always area. felt good once I got below nine or eight. Once I got below nine or eight, I could tell like uh, I'm not feeling you know nearly as good. Yeah. Um, but again, it's a stress on the body, which takes us to the next one, which is. Um, get really good sleep and, uh, and and manage your stress. Poor sleep just makes you feel shitty across the yeah. board. And I don't think people, a lot of people don't realize this. You don't have to have like terrible sleep. You just have to have kind of not good sleep <laughs> for long periods of time. When uh-huh. you then you not start to notice a big difference. I know for me, once I I was a six or seven hour a night guy, no problem every single night, and I was able to function and and I thought I was okay. I didn't notice a difference until I went and prioritized sleep. Once I prioritize eight hours a night, then I realize how I felt before. Yeah. I didn't realize it because the contrast wasn't there. Well, I don't know if this is like completely, I'm sure it's related on some level, but like, you know, the whole morning wood thing, like if if, if you're getting a lot of shitty sleep in a row, like that tends to be something I would notice is like versus really good sleep and you're waking up and, and noticing that, it, you know, that it's there. Yeah. A good, a sleep routine is really makes a big difference. I think a lot of people these days have issues with sleep because- they just take for granted that they can go hit the pillow and then go to sleep. They don't treat it. They don't give themselves time to wind down. Um, and this is a very simple thing that I've had clients do that has had great success with a lot of them is just an hour before bed. An hour before bed, you put on your blue light blocking glasses or you go by candlelight, turn off electronics, and just allow yourself to wind down. That tells your body to get ready for sleep. Mm-hmm. Then when you go to sleep and turn the lights off, the brain is already prepared. It's do you perfect. think that has a lot to do with us just being bombarded with all kinds of stress? And like that's our main way of kind of resetting it. Yeah. And if you're getting bombarded all day, and then in addition to that, you also don't get good sleep, it's just piling it on versus really helping you. you probably never fully recover. Yeah, and think about it this way too, with stress nowadays, like it was not long ago that you when, you, when you were at work, you had work, and then when you got home, work was done. Yeah. It's literally it with you. you. It's with Everywhere. you all the time, right? Your mm-hmm. email is right there. Your text message is right there. Your phone's always on you. So stress now, we don't. it's like we don't get breaks from it. Like we maybe no, have- You have to physically put all these barriers in place. I got to put my phone in a completely different room. Yep. I have to dim the lights. I have to you know, make sure my room's cool. Like all these things I really had to start to considering in order to get that kind of sleep that's that deep sleep that you really feel rejuvenated from. Well, Sal, what's your thoughts then on, you know, and I, our buddy Max, I know Lugavir talks a lot about this, that like all the chemicals that are in plastics and in certain foods and stuff like that, like how much do you think this is? And I've seen stuff around here to like kind of scare people yeah. and like doing any of that. I don't think it's, I personally don't think it's one of the big rocks, 
But I mean, how important do you think it is to be paying attention to those things? So like BPA and like what yeah, are yeah. So those are um, endocrine disruptors, right? So these are chemicals that uh, chemically are can can interact with like your estrogen receptor in your body. So it's like telling your body it has more estrogen, even though it doesn't. Here's the problem with it is that they're everywhere. So I don't think it's one thing. You know what I mean? I don't think it's like, oh, it's your deodorant. Yeah. Oh, it's your shampoo. Oh, it's the plastic that you warmed your food, food up in. I think it's just a combination of all these different things that might be causing things. Because honestly, they're, they're really trying to figure out why testosterone levels have been plummeting for so long. And believe it or not, this is one of the main reasons they think it is. It's literally all these chemicals. They do. Yeah, they do. And they, but it's just there's so many of them. They're everywhere. It's like... You remember, okay, you know nonstick pans, for example? You know that the chemical that in the nonstick pan- Teflon or whatever? Yeah, it comes off in your food, and it's like they'll, they'll test your blood. It's in your blood. It's in your system, yeah. you know, or, or uh, uh, fire retardants that they used to spray on so couches be, and well, stuff. So you're talking about, too, like in our drinking water, how like all these chemicals have just found their way in just from people peeing and then recycling the water. I, I read that. So I read this article about how people throw the prescription drugs mm -hmm. uh, in the toilet, yeah. and also- and like birth control. Yeah, like women on birth control, apparently a tiny amount comes out in their urine, but so many women take birth control and it's been, you know, obviously they pee all the time or whatever. That And you drink water <laughs> all the fact. time, right? You drink water all the time. Yeah. So it's like this tiny bit of birth control that you drink all the time. So then how, so, okay, so you're, what's, you're coaching a client, he's 20 years old, he's got this issue, yeah. you've, we've, we've gone this far already, you've, we've addressed all the big rocks so far, you're, now we get to this conversation around these, these, you know, chemicals. Yeah. What do you, how do you advise, like, the order of operation here? Like, I, I think an easy Easy one is like water. like things like this like uh you know if you have a bad habit of because I was guilty of this uh, a bad habit of when I was competing I was carrying around plastic Tupperware a lot Doug matter of fact Doug was the one who was bought me my first I think set yeah, you of, like microwave with yeah it too, I would right? yeah I would microwave this yeah plastic. that's a big one right so and I think that and it's a, it's an and it's an easy fix right throw away all that plastic start storing it all in glass, yeah, glass. I'm doing it so often I would think that that for me when I look look at all the the possibilities that could, are the biggest offenders. I thought, okay, that's an easy switch and, and could help, right? Yeah, that one. Then, uh, so talking to Max, you know what's a big one? I didn't realize this. Uh, uh, receipts, grocery store receipts uh, or retail what? receipts. Yeah, I remember he brought that up, yeah. They're coated in- So don't rub them all over some your of face. These, <laughs> some of these chemicals. He says every time you touch them- I do scratch and sniff. He yeah. says when you touch them, you're absorbing like ridiculous amounts of these chemicals. Really? Yeah, believe it or not. And I looked it up and he's absolutely- And you know, you ever touch them how they're kind of waxy or yeah, whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, when they say, you know, would you like a receipt? I'm like, no. No, no. It's already stored in my you know, your credit card or whatever. Wow, anyway. that's interesting. That, that would be like one of the big ones. Yeah, that one. Uh, and then filter water, right? Filter yeah. your water so that it's, uh, it's clean and it's getting out- whatever and, might and be in there. Carry them around a nice canister, not in the plastic yes. container. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Especially if you have a plastic container you leave in your car. Oh, if, yeah. If, Double whammy. Yeah. If it's cold, if it gets really cold or really hot, so if you leave it in your car and it's like snowing or if it's hot, then it starts to leak the. Oh, the really plastic. cold will do that too. It does. I knew really hot does that. I mean, I, I, I've done that before where you like grab it and you drink it and then it, like, it like, tastes like. Yeah, you taste like it. Things just happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like a soup of. <laughs> this what? can't be good. Yeah. Estrogen <laughs> water. This is toxic delicious. chemicals. No, no, yeah. So those those would be the bigger ones. Um, and then the last one, this one's the this one's one that's relatively new. Um, and it didn't, this didn't become a problem until maybe what, 15. 15, 20 years. I mean, when I was a kid, this wasn't really an issue, and that's uh, pornography. Yeah. You know, I, as a kid, you know, I, I didn't, I saw pornography. Um, I think everybody has, but it was so, uh, it was so less, so much less available, so valuable because it was so hard to find. Yeah. I mean, I remember as it a wasn't, kid, it wasn't as socially accepted as it is today. No, like right. today, it's like very accepted. Well, and even then, you get the, like, the, like softer forms of that, right? Even through Instagram and like, you're just inundated constantly with, you know, people that are scantily you know, clad and, and wearing like barely anything. Ain't that the truth? I feel like my, as a young teenage boy, I feel like- uh, My head would have exploded. Instagram was what, what my porn was. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that would be the stuff that you see on Instagram every day as a young kid was like what I found as a teenage boy <laughs> that, to Dude, me. Dude, I'm telling you, people laugh. I told this to my, you know, my son and I have this conversation because he's 15. So he's like right in the middle of, he's at the peak of like, oh, I want to, you know, see that kind of stuff. And so I have these conversations. And I say, look, man, when I was a kid, it was so unavailable that it was not uncommon to you would grab a, a magazine that would be like a, a JC Penny, 
you know, bra section, right. you know, because it just wasn't available. This is a hundred percent true. Or, right. you know, God forbid your dad had a national geographic. You're like, Oh, there might well, be yeah. an actual <laughs> naked boob in there. Whoa. It was super, super rare. You couldn't find it. And so we didn't get desensitized, uh, like you can now with pornography where it's available online so you can hide and get any, I mean, when I, when we were younger, if you wanted to get porn, yeah. you had to like, there, there was a curtain. Yeah. yeah, and he had to like walk, do the walk of shame, like through the curtain and all the beads, and then you you know everybody knows where you are and what you're trying to find in the video oh. store. Oh, or the or the guy behind the counter, you bought the magazine, he knows what you bought. You're not going to yeah. go back there every single day to get a different magazine, right? Right. Because otherwise, you look like a you know a creep or whatever. So it's so available now, and it's everywhere to the point where it starts to. So what, this has never happened in human history, right? We are desensitizing ourselves to visual, uh, you know, stimuli. Yeah. No different than food. Yeah, it's, it's like, like junk food. It's, 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 it's everywhere. It's, you know, it's like we've we've mastered the. I don't think we're going to have a famine anytime soon. You know, because of the way that we've been able to engineer food and, and provide. Oh, they meant like a porn famine. That's right. That's, <laughs> yeah, oh, like, we're like, have like, a yeah. porn famine. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, you're right. That's we not going to happen. Well, you yeah. know that there's so it's funny because there's actually groups on uh, online like Reddit will have these forums and stuff where. They're called no fap, you yeah. know, no fap groups. And these are young men that are going on there and saying, I'm not watching pornography anymore because I wasn't able to get, like I was, I was having erectile issues with my girlfriend or I was more into porn than I was yeah. into real people. So it's, it's, it's a real thing now um, that really we didn't have to, like I didn't have to like, you know, watch my use of it back in yeah. the day because Abs- it was auto- automatically limited. Yeah, abstaining is just a, a, a healthy practice in a lot of directions. I think it just provides you know, that time that you need to to analyze from the outside your behaviors. And I think this is definitely a part of that. Now, what are your thoughts on actually just television? Mm. Because I feel sometimes like, uh, I mean, we've all done this before. Where you've probably binged four or five episodes of something. You got really into it. You didn't have anything going on that day. And you, and you binge watch five episodes. I mean, can you guys relate to what you feel like after you do that? Yeah, garbage. Yeah, I feel terrible. And I think it's very obvious to me how I feel because I don't do that very often. It's once once in a while that happens and it's always like, oh my God, I would never tell you, oh, I got to get out. Get out, get out. get out of the house or let's go to the gym. Like I, I, I feel like I have to do that afterwards because I feel so lethargic. Now, I know this this young generation coming up, it's so it's so widely accepted to do that. There's media everywhere. Right. And it's, and it's, inc- I mean, Netflix's algorithm is do- designed that way to just keep feeding you more and more that you're more, I mean, they even have a section called binge worthy. Mm-hmm. So it's, we've, in- we've encouraged this binging on, on television. And I wonder if that even plays a role. So forget just, you're just watching porn, but just being staring at a screen for hours after hours, after hours, day after day, after day, I would yeah. think could have effect. On just it. not being present. You know, being distracted by things all the time uh, is actually a stress on Mm -hmm. the body. And you're right. You you can feel it inherently. Like if if you're listening right now and you've sat down and watched, you know, shows all day long and then it's over, you know, you feel it. You feel physically like it was a stress uh, on you. You're, You're stimulated visually. You're watching something, but you're not moving. You're not being present. It just doesn't feel good. So I, w- I would think so. And the opposite is true, right? So I always feel better about sitting down and watching television if I've ate well and exercised that day. A lot of times, like on the weekend, if there's something that Katrina and I know that there's a movie we want to watch or we, we know we're going to do that that day or night at some point, we'll always go to the gym first because I always feel better about lying around doing nothing mm-hmm. after I've gotten activity in. And so I don't know if that's like there's literally something going on chemically inside of me or just subconsciously I feel better about exercising. But actually, it's one of my favorite times to watch mm. something would be after a hard workout. Yeah. Yeah, it's like just chill and let's hang out. It's like you after. earned it. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. No, that, that's, a, that's a very, very good point. So there you go. There's your five ways that we've observed uh, both, well, not just with ourselves, but with clients. Um, and most of them, if not all of them, are, are tied to health. Good health uh, does lead to you know a high, better libido and a good, healthy sex life. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Doug at Mind Pump Doug, Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Oh, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's awesome. Okay, so when you're doing heavy sets with pull-ups, um, you want to, you don't want to train to failure, right? So pick a weight that you could do like four or five reps to failure and do three and then do two or yeah. three and then rest and then do it again and do like six or yeah. seven sets. Here's another strategy. 